And next we have uh, Professor Gary Rensberg, um, and uh, he is speaking on the Moses the Magician. I, I assume you haven't changed the topic. <laughs> okay. Okay, thank you, uh, Bernie. Um, left my glasses somewhere, they'll turn up. Um, so there's a handout that everybody should have which has the important text on it, but we'll proceed through the PowerPoint as well, and I'll just, uh, it's always hard to coordinate the two, so uh, let's do the best we can in, co in looking at both the images and the, and the handout. So I'm using this title, Moses the Magician, uh, very loosely, it's very broadly defined. It's a parallel study to an ar earlier article which I wrote, which you see in the first item on the handout, called Moses as Equal to Pharaoh, in which I showed that a number of the motifs in the portrayal of Moses in the book of Exodus are reflections of uh, the Pharaoh in Egyptian uh, texts. And in this uh, talk today, I'll review some of those in just a moment. In this talk today, I want to talk about Moses as the equal to the uh, Egyptian um, magician priest. So to go back just to review some of those uh, items, some of the salient ones that are in my um, uh, published article already, uh, in these two passages in the book of Exodus, Moses is elevated to the level of the divine, and Aaron is, is uh, concomitantly elevated from priest to prophet. Uh, this, of course, works in an Egyptian background where the pharaoh is uh, considered divine in Egyptian uh, religion. Uh, the whole story of Moses and the bulrushes uh, in Exodus chapter 2 um, and the uh, following uh, breastfeeding by his mother is an evocation of the story of Isis and Horus, one of the core uh, myths of ancient uh, Egyptian religion. And uh, this also helps explain uh, the very enigmatic passage in Exodus 34, Karan or Panav, that the skin of his face was horned, a literal reading, which is in fact the way this should be understood. And uh, this uh, evokes at least two images of New Kingdom pharaohs at the Luxor Temple. Um, I owe this to uh, David O'Connor, who put me on the right track. Uh, in understanding the, uh, the ram's horns, which uh, are on the cheeks of Amenhotep III and Ramses II. So that's just a brief review of the material that I published earlier, which hopefully will set the stage as we now look into uh, magical and literary portrayals that, are, um, that appear in the Exodus narrative. So at the burning bush scene, Moses has several objections. Uh, as to why he should not be the leader of the people. And one of them, of course, is that he doesn't know God's name. And when he asks God's name, or he anticipates that the people will ask, uh, ask him, Ma Shemo, what is his name, uh, God uh, responds not with the usual uh, terms which we know, whether it be Yahweh or Elohim or Shaddai or anything else we may be familiar with, but rather with the unique and very enigmatic Echye Asher Echye. Uh, the background for this, and for this you can look at page two on the handout, is the Egyptian tale, uh, the Egyptian story called The Unknown uh, Name of Ra on Papyrus Turin. I don't have a picture of the papyrus, so we'll just look at the lovely entranceway to the museum in Turin. And in this um, uh, narrative, um, the goddess Isis, you can read the text on your own as I talk or sk uh, skim down, uh, the goddess Isis seeks to learn the secret name or the unknown name of Ra, which he is unwilling uh, to supply for, to her, uh, at which point she needs to prepare a venomous snake which comes and bites um, uh, Ra, top of page three on the handout. And finally, at that point, and only at that point, does Ra, uh, almost at the point of death, need to disclose his unknown or secret name uh, to Isis, at which point she brings about the antidote uh, uh, to um, uh, bring Ra back uh, to health. Um, this is, um, Ron used the word a moment ago, an inversion of the, the biblical story is, uh, is parallel to the Egyptian text, but also an inversion of it in the sense that uh, the parallel, I hope, is clear, but it's important, of course, to stress the differences between the two as well, which is that when Moses asks uh, God for his secret name, God supplies it immediately. There's no need to, of course, engage in the kinds of things that happens between Isis and Ra. And secondly, not only does Moses learn the secret name of God, 
but also the reader learns the name, uh, as we saw in Exodus 3, Echia, Asher Echia, proudly proclaimed. If you look at the unknown name of Ra's story in the Torah and Papyrus, you'll note that the reader never lo learns the name. We learn only that Ra disclosed it to Isis, but we ourselves do not learn the name as the readers of the narrative. Here are our two deities. We now move to Exodus chapter 4, still atop the burning bush scene. I'm proceeding here chapter by chapter through the narrative. We had a wonderful presentation from Dick Friedman yesterday on the source critical issues involved. Uh, I prefer, my approach is, well, with great respect for Dick's work, is to treat these um, narratives as literary holes, holes with a W, literary units, uh, based on the kind of literary analysis that has been done in the last uh, generation of scholarship. So that's the preceding uh, uh, path here. In Exodus 4, um, uh, Moses now anticipates that he will return to Egypt and he will not have any power, nobody will believe him. So God empowers Moses and the way he does this is to empower him in the manner of a, an Egyptian um, magician priest who would be the most impressive individual in the court of the Pharaoh, which of course explains the tale um, no pun intended, sorry, the, the, the episode of casting the snake, uh, uh, the staff down onto the ground, it becomes a snake, and then when he touches it, actually grasps it by the tail, uh, it uh, reverts to the inanimate object. This is exactly what occurs in the famous wax crocodile story, which is in the West Car Papyrus now in uh, the Berlin Museum, and that's on pages three and four of uh, your handout where the magician priest is able to take a crocodile made out of wax uh, seven fingers long and turn it into a uh, living uh, crocodile of seven cubits long and, uh, and then uh, return it to its original inanimate, um, its original inanimate state. Um, the biblical text, of course, in um, Exodus 4, as we saw, uses the word nachash, snake. Here in Exodus 7, when Moses actually performs this task, when Moses and Aaron perform this task before Pharaoh, uh, the word tanin is used. And tanin has been much discussed. And um, in my opinion, I've published on this as well, it means crocodile. Again, the source critical issues aside, I would argue that what you have here is the transition from the desert um, uh, terrain where snakes are uh, common to the banks of the Nile River where Moses and Aaron are now before Pharaoh and therefore the word tanin or crocodile is used. And of course that gives us a bit of an upgrade, if, you can use, if I could use that term, from uh, the first action to the second action from snake to even more impressively the crocodile. Again, then that uh, evokes the crocodile of the Egyptian narrative we just uh, talked about. Holding snakes by the tail, uh, which he does in Exodus 4, brings us back to Moses as the equal to Horus slash Pharaoh. A uh, very prominent part of Egyptian artwork are the many Horus plaques where you see um, the uh, images, two examples of it right here. Uh, Horus standing at atop the crocodiles but holding uh, snakes and scorpions and so on by the tail. I've never found anyone, uh, a, a depiction of um, Horus or anyone else holding crocodiles by the tail, although uh, now apparently there is one because Stefan Munger showed a seal yesterday, uh, if I saw it correctly, is in indeed crocodiles being held by the tail. Let's now move to the 10 plagues, uh, starting with bottom of page four of the handout. Uh, some of these, of course, are so well known, and in fact, I should uh, at this point mention that almost everything that I'm presenting to you is well known, and hopefully my contribution is to put it into a coherent uh, and complete picture of some sort. The first plague, turning the uh, Nile into blood, has been noted by scholars, of course, for um, generations now, is um, paralleled in the admonitions of Ippaware, the uh, English translation from Nili Shupak is, re is replicated uh, for you at the bottom of page four. And you'll notice that the uh, turning of the river into blood, uh, less pr uh, prominently uh, noted, I think, by scholars, less commonly noted by scholars, is the, is, the, uh, is the connection between this action, the poor state in which Egypt is finding itself, um, and the presence of uh, foreigners in the land, using the Egyptian word here, 
uh, Pechtiu, literally bowmen, but meaning something like foreigners, uh, who are described, last words on the bottom of page four, uh, they are real, really uh, no people. I'm not going to show you something for every particular um, uh, plague. We'll skip to the third plague here, which is uh, the plague of lice. If you look at the top of page five on the handout, a uh, very prominent uh, comment from uh, Herodotus uh, in his book two, where he surveys the geography and culture and religion of Egypt, he notes um, that their priests shave the whole body every other day, that no lice or aught else that is foul may infest them in the service uh, of their gods. I think it's striking that Herodotus points to the lice in particular uh, as a reason and the, uh, for the priests needing to shave every day to keep themselves in a state of uh, purity. We could show many examples, of course, of Egyptian artwork of priests um, with their um, uh, shaven bodies and heads. And I also note the sixth plague is where the priests come back into the narrative. They disappear. Uh, the Khartoumim disappear after plagues one, two, and three. They come back only for a cameo appearance in plague six, uh, where the text notes that they too were afflicted by the shechin, the boils, um, uh, which of course indicates a knowledge of the Egyptian priesthood and what renders one uh, pure or impure, in this case, uh, a skin affliction and that, of course, correlates, again, well with what Herodotus himself informs us about these, uh, about the Egyptian priesthood. Uh, skipping back now to Plague 4 and Exodus uh, chapter 8, the Arov, the insect swarm. And here I just want to note um, that Herodotus takes note again of this as an element of Egyptian, um, uh, Egyptian physical world uh, in his very succinct comment that gnats are abundant. Um, and then he goes on, you can see this uh, about a fourth of the way down on the handout, page five, with a very long description of what the Egyptians themselves do to protect themselves from this pest with these sleeping high up and using nets and so on and so forth. Um, so again, the biblical text is speaking about the same kinds of things that appear either in our Egyptian text or in the um, narration of the most prominent Greek visitor uh, to ancient Egypt. The ninth plague is the plague of darkness, which lasts for three days. Um, this is um, paralleled, again, scholars have noted this, in the prophecy of Nefertiti. The main papyrus version of this is in the uh, Hermitage, so we'll just have a look at that since I don't have a photograph of the papyrus, but I am able to show you another copy uh, in the Petrie Museum um, in uh, London, a 19th Dynasty copy of this text. The English is there for you in the middle of um, page five. Um, went ahead too quickly. Um, and the uh, text reads, the sun is covered and does not shine for the people to see. No one can live when the clouds cover. And this again is associated with uh, the uh, foreigners, the Asiatics, the Amu, who have come into the land, have descended into uh, Egypt, bringing Egypt into a state of decline. A second example, a second instance of the mentioning of darkness occurs in this demotic text, uh, which we call Setni II. Uh, Setna Hamwas, as he comes to be known in later Egyptian texts, is the son of Ramses II, who serves as the high priest uh, in Memphis. And in one story, um, his um, wisdom in magic is surpassed by a man named C. Osire, who in turn cites a Nubian magician, bottom of page five on the handout, says that were it not that Amun would find fault with me uh, and that the Lord of Egypt might punish me, I would cast my sorceries upon Egypt and would make the people of Egypt spend three days and three nights seeing only light, seeing no light, only darkness. And again, the same idea of the three days as you have in the description of the ninth plague in uh, the book of uh, Exodus. Finally, we come to, finally in this section, we come to the death of the firstborn. <clears throat> and this too is mentioned in uh, three Egyptian texts, um, or four Egypt, three or four Egyptian texts that are known to me, starting in the earliest literary tradition that we have from ancient Egypt, the pyramid texts. Uh, this is the pyramid of Unas at Saqqara, uh, inside the pyramid here. And one of the, um, uh, one of the inscriptions uh, that you see on the, on the um, Walls, actually, here's a parallel text from the um, uh, Pyramid of Teti I, the founder of the Sixth Dynasty. 
And one of the texts that you find there uh, in parallel to each other um, is this uh, text, which I've translated for you on the top of page six, using the translation of Mordechai Gilula, who was the first one to point this out in the journal Tel Aviv, volume four, Piwa Jamedu Hana Yemen Renef Harupu En Semsu. Always sounds good to read a little Egyptian aloud. Uh, it is the king who will be judged uh, with him whose name is hidden on that day of the slaying uh, of the firstborn. Exactly what these texts refer to is not, all the, is not always clear, or I should say is, is, is quite um, opaque, but nevertheless, uh, the reading is clear and the meaning is clear uh, regarding the day of the slaying of the firstborn using the Egyptian word semsu here, which means the, the older ones or the eldest or uh, by extension, uh, the firstborn. I also want to take a moment to uh, thank our friends and colleagues at the Oriental Institute at the University of Chicago who have put all of Zeta's uh, Pyramidan text uh, on the internet, and this is also true of the Buck's coffin text, to which we now turn uh, as well. Just some sample coffins to remind ourselves of what these look like. And um, two coffin texts uh, published uh, by uh, de Buck, translations for you uh, on page six of the handout. Uh, this one refers to the uh, night of the slaying of the firstborn, uh, using the uh, a different term, the term wero here, which means the great ones, although by extension can also mean the, uh, the firstborn. And uh, you will notice at the bottom of the column, the bottom of the text, uh, is the divinity classifier or determinative, which suggests that somehow this is tied to uh, the divine in the minds of the author of this coffin text. And a similar wording in uh, yet another uh, uh, coffin text, a spell that is actually written out on four different coffins. So you read these in parallel columns. These all refer to uh, different coffins. Uh, the third one is uh, the most complete text there. So that's the one in the handout listed as the one in the Sakura storeroom. And the three parallels are in uh, the British Museum, the Louvre, and in Cairo. And here you seem to have a conflate text which refers to uh, both the night of the killing of the firstborn, or of the great ones, and the day of the killing of the firstborn, uh, or of the great ones, again, using the word weru. Um, the uh, top of page seven on the handout, um, the splitting of the sea, which is the end of the narrative that stretches from Exodus chapter one through 14, or 15, if you include uh, the uh, poetic version of it, um, Another story about Setna Hamwas, another demotic text in the Cairo Museum. So we'll just look at the, uh, the Egyptian Museum in Cairo. We'll just look at the beautiful hall that's in at the centerpiece of that um, uh, museum. And in this text, we have another magician who is named here, Nan Nefer Kaptach. Uh, and in his actions, he's able to separate uh, the waters so that he's able to bring up a box that was apparently at the uh, bottom of the waters. Um, but a more famous example of this, again, is from the uh, third tale on the papyrus uh, west car, which is in the bottom of page seven of the handout. The royal family is out on the lake for a boating party when a pendant of one of the princesses falls into the water. Um, she is uh, understandably upset um, when someone offers to give her a new pendant just like it. She says, no, I prefer my one, the one I have, to the one that you might give me, at which point uh, the chief lector priest, Jaja M. M. Anch, said his say of magic. I'm now reading from the translation. Uh, he placed one side of the lake's waters upon the other, and he found the pendant lying on a shard, and he brought it back and gave it to his owner. And then he uh, brought the waters back uh, together again, brought the waters back to their place. Now, it's at this point in the narrative in the book of Exodus, um, in the parallel to this, of course, where the Egyptians um, where the Egyptians drown. Uh, the drowning motif is the last item I want to share with you, which is on page uh, eight of the handout. And in these uh, New Kingdom um, funerary texts, the Amduat, especially here in the 10th hour from uh, KB 34, you'll notice along the bottom register uh, the drowned ones uh, in the water. Uh, unfortunately, we know less about this motif than we would like to know. But clearly, what we can determine from these texts is that the death by drowning is, in fact, a blessed event in Egyptian uh, religious uh, tradition. Some more images from the 
uh, website of the Theban mapping project of the same tomb. Um, this is paralleled in the Book of Gates, Ninth Hour. This is from um, a tomb shared by two lesser known pharaohs, KV-14. You see the drowned ones in the blue panel. Um, it's also on the um, uh, an Amduat papyrus in Berkeley um, that Leonard Lesko published. So um, you can see it about on the left-hand side, three individuals who are uh, floating as drowned in the same position, the same stance as we saw in the tomb walls. And um, one picture that I myself took, it's pretty high up on the tomb of Ramses uh, VI in uh, KV-9, but you can see the drowned ones uh, in the blue panel up above. Now we know something about this. If you look at the handout, top of page eight, Herodotus again informs us when anyone is known to have been carried off by a crocodile or drowned by the river itself, such as one must by all means be embalmed and tended as fairly as may be and buried in a sacred coffin by the townsmen of his place. His body is deemed something more than human and is handled and buried by the priests of the Nile themselves. The biblical text here accordingly, this is not an inversion, I would go further and say this is a subversion of the Egyptian motif, which is to say that if you, the Egyptians, think that death by drowning is a blessed event, we can arrange that for you. <laughs> and the author of Exodus 14, based on the poem of Exodus 15, in fact displays the death of the Egyptians in just that way. One final uh, text um, from the, uh, actually the written part of the Amdawa 10th hour text, uh, you, are uh, you are those who are within noon, uh, the drowned who are in his following, may life belong to your Baz. Final point to make here to show once more how the biblical text uh, evokes Egyptian images, but at the same time uh, uh, includes a, uh, an item of difference, is the portrayal of the Egyptian magicians in uh, the book of Exodus. And here are four passages. When they do their magical acts, they always do it by their spells, bilatehem or bilatehem, a uh, longer form of the word and a shorter form of the word. Um, that they need to recite magical spells in order to perform their magic. And of course, this is exactly what one finds in the Egyptian text we looked at, especially in the two Westgar papyrus stories, the wax crocodile story and the boating party story. And I think this is known to many in the room. Needless to say that when Moses and Aaron do this, the ends may be the same, but the means is very different. They are able to accomplish these tasks because they have been empowered to do so directly by God. There is no magic in Israel, and accordingly, they do not use their, lah their lahatim. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gary. Again, introducing a new element, um, and this time, uh, we want to get some bodies' opinions other than uh, Bill Deavers, so <laughs> let's go. Uh, uh, yeah. Well, thank you so much. I'm interested in, uh, sorry, uh, Thomas Schneider. Um, I'm very much interested in what you're doing because I will be trying this afternoon to do something similar as, uh, at the end of my summation paper. Um, I would like to very much to know how this dovetails with the idea of the genesis of the, the, the Exodus text. So, because you have been drawing on parallels uh, within an Egyptian textual universe of uh, tens of thousands of texts uh, that span uh, thousands of years, it's always possible to find parallels for anything you want, basically, right? So, um, my idea is. Um, how do you think? Do you think that the Egyptian, the, um, the the authors or editors of the Exodus narrative, they would have actually have access to some of those those, those motifs? Uh, if so, in what form? At what what time? In what context? And um, some of these the, the motifs you refer to were 2,000 years apart or so, right. or even more from the Exodus narrative, not accessible. Uh, don't you think that one would have to look at the genres? So for example, if you look at the plague narrative, to look at apocalyptic texts from Egypt, maybe more specifically texts from the late Greco-Roman period that are closer to the uh, composition of the Exodus and then try to figure out if, if there was a transfer of motifs from specific, a specific context that is closer to the Exodus context. So I was, I'll start with just one thing which you said at the end when you referred to the Greco-Roman period texts from Egypt. Um, I certainly do not see the uh, Exodus account coming from that time period, but rather from the early monarchy, 
based on its yet earlier tradition, which of which we have one snippet in the poem of Exodus 15. It is true that I, the Set um material is only attested in the Demotic uh, uh, period because the traditions about this um, magician son, a high priest son of Ramses II, grew um, over time. Um, we do, these texts do, of course, come from Old Kingdom all the way through New Kingdom and, in fact, Late Period. You're, quite, you're absolutely correct about that, Thomas. Um, and we are blessed with a wealth of Egyptian literary and artistic material, which allows us uh, to uh, perform this um, research that I have done. What I would say in response is that the material which is evoking Egypt occurs in this text in the Bible, which is, of course, set in Egypt. And these are motifs that do not occur in Mesopotamia, and they do not occur in Ugaritic uh, texts either. So that there, 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 there is an attempt here to portray, uh, which, which would be my control, given the fact that I am obviously taking material over a span of two millennia. Um, and so all I can say is that there must have been some good knowledge of Egyptian culture, uh, not because they had the papyri or were looking at texts or, any, or reading Herodotus or anything, but rather they just knew the culture of Egypt and the religious traditions of Egypt well enough because of the intersection of the two cultures of Egypt and Canaan that uh, are uh, you know, throughout the entire period that we're talking about. And whether there was an exodus or not is not the point here, um, but rather uh, what could an average ancient Israelite have known about ancient Egypt? And I think that these texts, in fact, show the answer to that question is quite a bit. Richard Friedman, please. Dick Friedman. This is a methodological point both for you and for Dan. You both used the expression leaving aside and setting aside. You used it a, a lot more than Gary did, but you both. So the th my point is that the things that you set aside were crucial things that you don't set aside. Uh, you say your model is to work with the text as a whole. You know I wrote two commentaries on the Torah, one where I do it your way and one where I do it my way. Mm -hmm. But there are limits. When you do each one, you have to do it by its own set of rules. You can't say... Well, it's Nahash, which is what occurs out in the wilderness, and Atanin, which is what occurs in Egypt. And not note that you know the, the Nahash occurs in J, that had a Nahash back in its creation story, and the, the Tanin is in P, which had a Tanin back in its creation story. And you, you can't have the, the, the event at the Malone take place saying, leaving aside what happened at the burning bush, when the same author, the, the author of J, did have a burning bush, and it had everything to do with what happens at the Malone. So my response, Dick, of course, is that there will be a footnote, I'm being very serious, in which I will note exactly what you have just stated. I'm not uh, attempting to turn a blind eye to it, but obviously there's only so much one can do in a 25-minute presentation, and I wanted to work with the text in its final literary uh, form. And of course, for all the work that we do, no matter whether we're documentarians, supplementarians, or whatever, uh, we all must come to eventually realize that the text achieved the form in which it presently is, and that itself is, and that is its, and that therefore is also a text worthy of inquiry. Okay, thank you very much. Uh